Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. You know, I, I, like many people sitting here today, did not start my life off to become an alcoholic. I had goals and I had dreams and I had things that I wanted to do with my life as a young man. And I didn't know anything about alcohol or alcoholism or the progression of alcoholism. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it was like, what happened, and what it was like now. I had my first drink when I was about nine months old. I was having trouble with my teeth, you know? And God, I I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, I didn't know where the heck I was, and I wet my pants. And, And then I didn't drink for about 13 years. And then I went on an 18-year slip. (laughs) And I ended up the same way. I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, I didn't know where the heck I was, and I wet my pants. (laughs) And so I come into AA. And I wish it was that funny, but it wasn't. I caused a lot of heartache and a lot of misery. For the simple reason, I didn't know anything about the progression of alcohol. I had my first drink when I was 13 years old, and I was sitting under a railroad truss in Pawtucket, and uh, it was New Year's Eve, and me and another guy had (laughs) got together, I think, about 75 cents, and we went out and bought a quart of Petri Port wine. And we sat under that bridge, and we both took a couple of slugs out of that bottle, and God, my eyes were dancing, and I was ready to roll. I said, boy, this stuff is great. Because all these other feelings disappeared. All these feelings that I had long before I picked up a drink. The feelings of loneliness, the feelings of being a second-class citizen, the feeling as, as not being as good as. And when I had that drink, everything changed. And so from that point on, every chance I got to drink, I drank. And I didn't care what it was. Because it put me in that world of fantasy. And I was to chase that for many, many years. I drank all through high school. I I was a weekend warrior. We used to get our money together and... And in them days, they didn't have small bottles. They had the quarts. And we'd buy a bunch of quarts and go out in the woods in the winter. And in the summer, we'd head for the beach. And, uh, God, I thought this was living, you know. And, and, I, and I thought drinking a lot was the mark of a man. And, God, I wanted to be a man. And so I drank like a pig, you know. And I figured the more you could swell down, you know, the bigger man you were. And... And, and and I had a reputation in high school, and, and if you asked me, I would have never known it, but, uh, God, I looked at my yearbook like 20 years after I graduated, and, uh, God, you wouldn't believe, do you know how people sign your yearbook? Well, my yearbook was signed with, good luck, Bill, stay sober, good luck, Bill, stay out of the Polish home, you know, or stay out of the scramblers, and, you know, all these people, you know, would make reference to my drinking. And when I got out of high school, I was a guy that knew everything and didn't know nothing. But I wanted to be a man. And so I was walking by the post office one day, and I saw a poster on the sidewalk. It says, the Marine Corps builds men. I say, that's for me. Up the stairs I go. Three months later, I'm in Paris Island. It's 104 degrees. And I'm saying, what the heck am I doing here? And they, you know, I, all I could picture in my mind's eye was getting the heck off of Paris Island. I, I figured that would be an accomplishment if I can do it. And so 
I, I figured if I could get off Paris Island, all I wanted to do, the only ambition I had in life was I wanted to drink beer and chase broads. And that's exactly what I did. I got out of Paris Island, and, and I got myself in a lot of trouble. I went, you know, all around the world, and God, I, I always had to be escorted back to the ship. You know, uh, the captain that I worked for, you know, he used to tell me when we go out on liberty, he'd say, Bill, see if you can com come back without a, an SP attached to each arm, you know? But I never could because any time we went to port and they, they, they had a perimeter that was, you know, you could go there, but anything out of that was restricted. With the thinking that I had, I figured the restricted area was where all the good stuff was. So that's where I'm heading. And, and so I'd head there and I'd get caught and I'd get back to the ship. And I got bus and I got, you know, office hours and court marshals and, and I was always pointing the finger at, you know, Jesus, couldn't they give me a break? Then they know I made a mistake, you know. I mean, I stole a Jeep one time and I was bringing it back after I got drunk. And my foot slipped off the brake and hit the gas pedal, and I ran into this old wooden barracks and knocked it, you know, a foot off its foundation. And it was a section of the barracks that had all the MPs in it. And Jesus, they all come out with their guns. And, you know, I was trying to explain this to a first lieutenant, and he don't want to hear it. And I went to the brig. Nobody would give me a break, you know. All my luck was bad. I was always in the right time, uh, wrong place at the right time, or uh, you know, the wrong place, the right place at the wrong time, and uh, and this is how it went. And I finally got out of the service with an honorable discharge, which was through no fault of my own. I came back to Pawtucket, <coughs> and we used to hang around the, the mahogany bar on, on Main Street on Saturdays and Friday nights, and we used to play cards and watch the fights and you know, or shoot crap or whatever. And, you know, I was hanging around there, and I noticed, you know, a lot of the guys that, that we hung around with were disappearing on Saturday. And, and I found out these guys were getting married, you know. And I said, well, well, maybe that's what I need. Maybe if I had someone in my life that loved me and someone that needed me and wanted me, maybe that's that void that, that I, I felt was missing here. And so I, I looked around, and, and I found this girl, and we started going out. And the first thing you know, we fell in love, and uh, then we got engaged. And, uh, you know, I'm drinking continually all this time. I mean, uh, I used to pick her up on Saturday night after I had been drinking all afternoon, and, and we'd go out to a nightclub, and she couldn't understand how I'd be gaga after two drinks, you know. But I, I had been drinking all day, you know, and... Uh, we had set a date for the wedding, and about six months before we were to get married, I called her up and I said, Betty, I think you and I are going to have a talk. So I took her to a, a spot in East Providence off the, they used to call it, I think, the Barrington Parkway. And I, uh, you know, all the young lovers used to go there. It's overlooking the Providence River, and you can listen to the grass grow, you know. And uh, I said to her, Betty, I said, you don't want to get mixed up with me. I says, uh, I'm going to cause you a lot of heartache and I'm going to cause you a lot of misery. I said, I'm nothing but a bum. And she was a young girl who did love. And uh, she said, no, Bill, don't think of yourself that way. Every, everything's going to be fine. When we get married, you'll see. So I said, okay. And about three months later, I called her up and I took her to the same place and I told her the same thing. That was the opinion I had of myself at 22 years of age. That I was nothing but a bum and that I would cause her a lot of heartache and a lot of misery. But she was a young girl that was in love and she knew love can change everything. So she said, no, we get married, things will be different. And she was right. And things were different but they weren't different the way she thought they were going to be. Because we were only married about 10 months. We had our first child, and then we had another one, and then we had another one. And it seemed like, for me, 
the more responsibility I had, the more I drank. Because I didn't know progressive disease. I didn't know that it was going to, you know, affect me mentally and physically and spiritually. I didn't know that I was on a grease slide, that these things would all eventually be removed from me. The family, the job, the car, and most important, my own self-respect. And I continued to drink, and I, uh, I felt that I couldn't, you know, I couldn't uh, drink with, with one pay, so like most of all, because I got a part-time job, you know, for beer money. And uh, the only thing is, I used to get things a little confused, you know. I used to, My wife used to end up with the check from the part-time job, and I used to blow the check from the full-time job. And she used to ask me, Bill, why do you drink? And I'd look at her like a dummy, and I'd say, I don't know. And I didn't know. And it got to a point where I was, you know, borrowing money off everybody at work. I was sitting in a bar one day, and I I had about $3 on me, you know, and I wanted to go on a real twister. Now, where the heck are you going to go with three bucks, you know? And I'm sitting with this guy, and he's in the same boat as I am. And, uh, you know, I was telling him, you know, I felt like really going on a twister in this. And he goes over to the phone, he puts a dime in the phone, and calls some guy, he comes back and sits down. And he buys me a drink. I said, what'd you do, hit a horse or something? <laughs> ah, no, he says, I called up a friend of mine. He says, a loan company, and get some money. He said, do you need some money? I said, yeah. He said, well, come down down there with me. So I said, all right. So I go down this loan company with him, and uh, he introduces me to the guy. And, then, you know, the guy said, you, you need some money? And I said, yeah. And he, well, how much do you need? I mean, I don't want to scare the guy off, you know. So I said, ah. 500, I said, i got to fix the transmission in my car, you know. Ah, oh, no problem. He took me in a little cubicle, you know. I signed about 15 papers. I don't know what the heck I signed. I didn't care. I wanted that 500. He gave me the 500. Boy, I got outside that door, and he did say one thing that was fatal to him. On the way out, he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Bill, if we can help you anymore, don't hesitate to come back. And I go, oh, boy, I put that right back there. And I got outside that door, and I said, I was so proud of myself that I conned this guy out of $500. You know, I only had to pay $30 a month for 42 years. You know, I didn't care. <laughs> but, uh, you know. So what does an alcoholic do that has $500 and is happy? I stopped to have a drink. And after the $500 was gone, I come home. And I come home to my wife and three children. Broke, sick, full of I'm sorry, full of all. Never do it again. And I was to do this over and over and over. And I'm not proud of this. This is what alcoholism was reducing me to. I got to a point where I couldn't borrow money anymore. And I can remember sitting in my bathroom 4.30 in the morning with one of my kids' piggy banks and a knife and taking the money out of that piggy bank, looking in that mirror and seeing my reflection and saying, what kind of a man are you? that you would steal from your children to drink. But see, I didn't know. I was no longer drinking because I wanted to. I was drinking now because I had to. I had to have a drink in order to live with the pain that I was causing myself and my family. I had a wife and three children that I loved. I lived in suburbia. I had everything a young man would want. And yet, I would come home, and if there was a light burning in my house, because my wife used to wait up for me, and she'd stay up and read. And if I saw a light on in the house, I always had a couple of bottles of beer and a Coke bottle full of vodka with a cork in it. And if that light was on, I would drive right by the house, go to an empty field, 
I would drink that vodka and drink that beer and cry myself to sleep in the front seat of my car. And when the sun come up, I would go home, and like a thief in the night, I would sneak in the house, clean up and change my clothes and go to work. And I couldn't understand this. Why was I doing this? And finally, finally, on a Saturday night, in a crummy little bar in Pawtucket, I was watching a Providence College game. They were in the, uh, the NCAA. And it was about 9 o'clock at night. And I pushed a couple of drinks away. I picked up the change off the bar. And I put it in my pocket. And I went home. It was the first time that I ever went home with money. I always went home the same way. Broke, sick, full of I'm sorry, full of I'll never do it again. And believe me, folks, I got a cellar full of them. But this night it was different. I went to bed, and I didn't talk to anyone. I didn't look at anyone, and I, went, I covered myself with a sheet. And I didn't want to talk to anyone. And I laid in that bed for two days. Here I was, the walking encyclopedia, the guy that knew it all, laying in his bed like a beaten pup. And I didn't know what the heck to do. And I didn't know how the heck I got there. And so what does an alcoholic do when he's in trouble? He prays. And I prayed them two days. I said, dear God, let all these troubles be gone when I open my eyes and I can start off fresh. And I must have done this 2,000 times in two days. And every time I opened my eyes, I was looking at the white sheet that I had over my head. I finally got up on a Monday morning, shaking like a leaf. I poured a half a cup of coffee. I had figured it out. I can go to Fuller Sanatorium and I would get everybody off my back. My job, the bank, the department stores, the loan companies, my wife. And I was shaking like a leaf sitting at the kitchen table and I was trying to look up Fuller's phone number and my wife come out and she said, what are you looking for? And I said, full of tennis, full of sanatorium's phone number. She said, why don't you look under the A's? And I thought she didn't know how to spell. <laughs> but she knew what she was talking about. And I called Alcoholics Anonymous in Providence. And I talked to a young lady. And she said that she could send a couple of guys out to my house. Or that I could go out there and there's a gentleman out there that would speak to me. Now, there was no way a young American boy like me living in suburbia was going to have a couple of guys in trench coats come out to my house because that was my conception of AA. I said, no, I'll come out there. So I went in the bedroom. I started getting dressed, and my wife started getting dressed, and I said, where are you going? And she said, I ain't going to miss this. I'm going with you. <laughs> and, and I'm going to tell you <laughs> Thank God today that she did, because I don't think I would have made it there to Providence by myself. And at the time, the, the Central Service Office was on Avon Street, right across from the Pirate's Den. And you know, it's amazing how we are with our phony pride. Christ, I had been thrown out of the Pirate's Den a half a dozen times, you know. But this AA uh, office was across the street, up the stairs on the second floor. I made sure there was no cars or pedestrians coming in either direction, and I made a beeline up them stairs. And when I got up there, I thought I was home free, and there were two little old ladies in a tailor shop, and they said, you looking for Alcoholics Anonymous? <laughs> and I felt like crawling through the floorboards, you know, but I said, yeah. <laughs> and I, went, I met this guy, and he put his hand out, and he said his name was Bob K. and he asked me a very simple question. He said, do you think you're having trouble with booze? And I said, yeah, I think so. And he said something very, very important to me that day that I hope I will never forget. He put his arm on my shoulder, his hand on my shoulder, and he said, uh, Bill, he said, you never have to be alone again. And I didn't know what he meant. And I didn't know what he was going to do. I didn't know what he was going to say. But I knew he was going to help me. And so for once in my life, I went in a room with him, 
And I sat down, and I kept my mouth shut, and I listened. And he talked about how he drank, what he drank, things that happened when he drank, how he thought. And most important, he talked about how he felt. He talked about guilt and remorse and that feeling of impending doom and that feeling of indecision. And I said, my God, here's a perfect stranger talking about things that I thought were weaknesses. And he was telling me, unashamed, trying to help me. And and it was like somebody took a two-ton weight off my shoulder. I said, my God, who's it my problem? That's what I got to do. I got to stay away from booze. He said, look, do you mind if I give a couple of guys your address and they swing by your house and pick you up and take you to me? I said, no, not at all. Man, I, I was, I went, my wife and I went out of there that day and I was dancing. I said, God, I know what's wrong with me. I'm not a nut. You know, because I thought I was crazy. Alcohol's my problem. And I went to a meeting that night. And that young girl at the office, you know what she told us, Bob K. when I left? She said, that bum won't stay sober a week. How did somebody say that about me? <laughs> but she said that because even though I was down and out when I went to that office, I still had that phony arrogance and that ego that alcoholics have. And she said, I walked in there like I owned a joint. And even though I didn't feel that way. But anyway, I went to a meeting that night, and I heard a guy, a, a disbarred lawyer speak in Salt Attleboro, hadn't had a drink in 90 days, and I said, wow, 90 days, that's unbelievable. Maybe I can do this. Maybe if I try it. So I went to meeting after meeting after meeting, and I stayed sober month after month after then a year. Then my sponsor said to me, you've been sober a year now. You having fun? I said, yeah. He said, now you're going to get to work. Well, what do you mean? He said, now we're going to incorporate the 12 steps of recovery into your life. And we went to work at it. And it wasn't easy for me. You know, you have to be honest. And you have to be, the first place you got to start is you got to be honest with yourself. And I had a difficult time doing that. And I had a difficult time forgiving myself. You know, I had a lot of guilt when I first got sober. <laughs> I used to uh, I used to drive to work <laughs> and I would have to stop my car because uh, I would think of some of the things that I did, you know, when I was drinking and it would, it would be too much for me. And it took me a long time, and I talked it over with my sponsor. And he used to say to me, who the heck do you think you are, God? He forgives you. You forgive yourself. You were insane when you were in the throes of alcoholism. I couldn't understand that. He said, you were insane when you were in the throes of alcoholism. He says, time heals everything. But you have to be honest, and you have to forgive yourself. And we went into the 12 steps of recovery, and I tried to incorporate them into my life. And he was to teach me many, many things. He taught me how to live. I was just in a sponsor, sponsorship uh, discussion they had over here in the other room. And uh, I heard one fellow saying that, that his sponsor taught him how to, and that's what this sponsor did with me. He taught me how to live. But he also taught me the principles of the fellowship of AA. And that was, once I became honest, once I started incorporating the 12 steps for recovery into my life, I was to pass it on. And so that's what I've been doing ever since. And I try, I try to incorporate the 12 step recovery into my life every day. You know, you, he, one thing that was very valuable to me, and he expressed it to me, was it's impossible for you to give something away you don't have. And he said, don't you forget that. He says, there's a lot of people in AA, and a lot of the people are not too honest, and a lot of people are, 
You know, like I heard a guy say the other day, in a bar room, you know, you had 10% of them in there that were jerks. Well, you got the same thing in AA. You got 10% of the jerks. And they, he said, you just, you stay away from them people. And another thing that was important, he told me to listen to everyone. Everyone. And I do. I listen to everyone. I don't care if they're three months sober or 40 years sober. And believe it or not, I learn from everyone. I'm still listening and I'm still learning. I still try to put my hand out there for the sick and suffering alcoholic. I try to do the right thing. I try to practice the steps of recovery in my everyday life. And every night when I, before I go to bed, I look in that mirror and I say, Bill, how'd you do today? And most of the time I've had a good day. But if there's anybody new or anybody coming back, keep coming. Give it a shot. Get a sponsor. Join a group. You know, it, it's, it makes it so much easier. I got a great group that I belong to now. And all the groups I belong to are all good. They were all good to me. And I want to thank, you know, the God of my understanding. And you people are the ones that helped me stay sober. And you were the people that taught me how to live. And, and most important, that was very instrumental in my recovery, <clears throat> was my best friend, <clears throat> my wife. Because she always encouraged me and never, never said no when I was going to go on a commitment or to a meeting. And for that, I'll be forever grateful. I hope God is as good to you as he has been to me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.